Okay, I guess we can uh, go ahead and begin this uh, discussion about the uh, American Austrians. And uh, in this lecture, we don't uh, we don't want to talk about the uh, uh, late uh, 20th century American Austrians or the 21st century American Austrians. In other words, we don't want to talk about ourselves. Uh, we want to talk about the American Austrians of the. Uh, uh, of the uh, early uh, 20th century, of the turn of the 20th century. Uh, one reason this topic is of some interest is because there was the, uh, seemingly in retrospect, there was the possibility that there would actually develop an, an American-Austrian school uh, centered around uh, Frank Fetter, who we'll talk at uh, some length about, and uh, Herbert Davenport, you may have heard that name kicked around a few times this week. Um, both of them were uh, Mengarian. Both of them uh, were strict uh, subjective value theorists. Uh, Fetter, as we'll mention uh, more, uh, was a very uh, charismatic figure. Uh, he was uh, chairman of the department at Princeton for uh, 20 years. So he had a big post. He was president of the AEA. You know, he's a big shot. He wasn't the biggest of the big shots, but he was you know, a well-known economist in his day. <clears throat> uh, but for various reasons, which, which I won't go into because I really want to just talk about the uh, views of these different uh, thinkers, um, n- nothing came of this. It, just, it fell apart. Um, one uh, thing to take into account in this is that Davenport and Federer hated each other. And, and so there was never any, uh, you know, desire on their part to combine their efforts and to try to create a, a movement or a group of students uh, coalescing around their views. That, that, was, that was certainly a huge problem. Uh, another was that Fetter himself uh, was partially co-opted into the progressive movement. Uh, Fetter was good friends with all the high muckmucks of the uh, American Economic Association and as you know these, these guys were basically in their political views of progressives and so anytime they wanted to give Fetter any uh, prominence it was always on issues where Fetter was an interventionist and this was uh, especially true they, f- they found one area where, where Fetter was uh, not sound and this was on antitrust and so he got all he, he got all these appointments to a government commi- excuse me commissions uh, on antitrust and he uh, Pittsburgh steel cases and so on and so forth in the early uh, 20th century. So so in a part you know his energies were transferred into his uh, worst area, sort of Rothbard's law, right? And he's specializing in his worst area. This wasn't his preference, so to speak, uh, but just his friends would push him this way because they were pro- uh, progressive types. Uh, so the, some some reasons why uh, nothing ever came of this. Um, now, uh, uh, in the lecture, I want to talk about three uh, individuals, though, uh, who who formed uh, what we might call a uh, a three part strategy that could have through these three men could have been uh, employed to develop uh, an Austrian American school. So we have Frank Fetter in what we might call high theory. Frank Fetter was a high theorist. Again, he did uh, some work in uh, government uh, commissions and things like this, but by and large, he was, he was a high theorist. <clears throat> and then I'd also like to talk a little bit about Henry Hazlitt, who was the public intellectual of this movement. <clears throat> and then finally, Benjamin Anderson, who we might consider to be the practitioner Although Anderson was a good, a great theorist, really in his own right. Uh, the, these three uh, levels of uh, involvement, high theory, the public intellectual, the practitioner level, uh, are all mentioned by uh, Murray Rothbard in his strategy uh, writings about how we advance the free market philosophy. You know, we have to have people working in all these areas, right? High theory. And we have to have people uh, making, uh, making this high theory available to the public, you know, writing in newspapers and so on and so forth. And we have to convince practitioners that we're right. If we're right, our theory should apply to the world. 
and there should be people practicing these theories. Uh, interestingly, the more we learn about uh, Ludwig von Mises, the more we find th- through some of the work, uh, especially of Guido Holtzman in writing the uh, biography, that Mises himself played all three of these roles. We knew this, of course, about Murray. You know, it's fairly obvious because we knew him well, but uh, uh, of course it's indisputable that Mises was a high theorist. But what wasn't well known until... Uh, until Guido began to do his uh, biography in detail and the discovery of the Moscow archive uh, of his stolen papers, um, is that, uh, is that uh, Mises, uh, before he uh, moved to Geneva in 1934, was a media celebrity. He was like a Paul Krugman, you know, or somebody. The, the uh, media would always go to Mises in Vienna and say, well, what do you think about this proposal? Or what, you know, what's your opinion on this or that? Uh, element in the news. And so, so Mises was writing op-ed pieces and you know, being interviewed by the papers and so on and so forth. He was playing this public intellectual uh, role. And of course, we've always known that Mises was a uh, not a practitioner in the sense that I identified Benjamin Anderson, but he was certainly involved in uh, applied economics. He spent almost all of his time, in fact, until 1934 in applied economics, working at the Chamber of Commerce in Vienna, you know, he was just writing government reports about you know, what, what to do with rent control and uh, you know, things like this. Uh, so let's start uh, with uh, Fetter. Uh, Fetter was born in a little farming uh, town in Indiana called Peru, Indiana. Uh, he was born in March of uh, 1863. This was uh, just a few months before Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg. That's how old he was. <laughs> Uh, he died in 1949, uh, took his bachelor degree from the University of Indiana, or from Indiana University, in uh, 1891, and uh, th- this, this was a momentous event. Uh, Fetter had been an entrepreneur. He ran his uh, father, his father became ill, and he ran a bookstore, and Fetter took it over when he was young. He was a teenager, he was like 14 or 15, and he ran the operation as very entrepreneurial. And he had the chance to go to college. He, you know, he was able to fund himself to go to college. When he went to college, he met Jeremiah Jenks, who was, who, uh, you know, was a became a very famous uh, progressive economist. Jenks went on to Cornell the next year. Jenks was there one year. Went on to Cornell, and so when Fetter wanted to gr- do graduate work, he got a hold of Jenks, and Jenks got him into Cornell. Otherwise, you know, Fetter would have never gone to a big name school like that. <clears throat> and he never would have be, uh, really, uh, he went on to get his Ph.D. in Germany. But anyway, he gets his master's degree at Cornell the next year, 1892. And then because he's connected with the progressives through Jenks, he gets an appointment at the universities of Heidelberg, University of Halle is where he got his degree, his Ph.D., in 1894. He, stu- he studies under Nice, Karl Nice, who was the teacher also of Bumbav work in Wieser. He was an old, older German historical school uh, economist. So he, became, he did his dissertation in German. Right? This is a guy who was born on a farm right, in Peru, Indiana. So he does his dissertation in German. It's on population theory, which is a very uh, hot topic at the time. It's since, of course, gone completely off the radar scope of economists. But uh, you know, he's obviously, he was a, a superior intellect. He's a master German to the point where he could actually write his dissertation. In that language, he came, he came uh, later to know Bumbav work uh, personally. He uh, traveled to Europe periodically after, you know, achieving his PhD and establishing himself as a uh, an economist in America, and uh, attended the seminar, attended Bumbav work seminar when he would uh, uh, travel in Europe. So he was well known to the Austrian uh, economist. He was known to uh, Bumbav work. He Although I don't have any evidence that he personally knew Mises, he must have known Mises because he attended the seminar, the Seminar. In 1911, 1912, he was at the seminar. Okay. So he must have known Mises, uh, at least by sight, or uh, Schumpeter, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, when he came back uh, to America, he taught uh, for one year at Cornell. He went to the University of Indiana for a few years. He got a post at Stanford. This was in 1898. And probably would have stayed at Stanford his whole career, but he was three years into his tenure at Stanford, and a friend of his got uh, fired 
uh, and, he, and uh, a Federer uh, considered this a violation of his friend's academic freedom, and he resigned. So he gave up this big shot post at Stanford uh, on principle of uh, academic freedom. Uh, luckily, Jenks was still at Cornell, so he got hired at Cornell, spent 10 years at Cornell, and then he went to Princeton. And that's where he you know, basically uh, spent his career. So he was at Princeton from 1911 to 1933. He was chairman of the Department of Economics at Princeton. Um, again, th- imagine this. Uh, he, you know, as I'll show you in a minute, I, I think I, I can, can demonstrate this. He, he was as hardcore uh, an Austrian, sort of Mengarian Austrian uh, economist as anybody of that day. You know, Mises was certainly not yet a mature economist. He, he was perhaps the leading subjective value theorist of, alive at the time. And yet he, uh, he, he was a, a big shot in America. He wasn't, he wasn't blocked out of academia, like, uh, say, Murray Rothbard was his whole career. Um, he, he, uh, he got visiting uh, professorships at Harvard, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, Northwestern, the Claremont Colleges. He taught at all those places on a visiting uh, status. Again, the, he was chairman of the Department of Princeton. He was Ivy League, uh, big shot. Uh, president of the American Economic Association. I uh, published eight books, roughly a hundred scholarly articles, the articles in the top journals, uh, AER, QJE, JPE. He published uh, numerous, uh, very important articles. All of it was hardcore subjective value stuff. Yeah, it's getting it published in the top journals. Um, well, anyway, um, times were different back then. The orthodoxy was forming, and uh, and uh, these views were, you know, increasingly uh, squeezed out. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about his uh, contributions. Uh, he's he's uh, best known for his work in capital and interest, which we've uh, talked about earlier in the week, and perhaps because of uh, the book that Murray uh, Rothbard edited by that title. Uh, it was articles that Fetter had written uh, in the 1890s and and through the early decades of the 20th century. And in these articles, uh, what Fetter's great achievement was is to, uh, was to be perhaps the first, the first we know of at least, uh, economist, to have a pure time preference theory of interest. So he took Boombaugh's theory, which was a mixture of uh, productivity and time preference, it's kind of a strange mixture, Again, we won't go into the details of that, and and purge the productivity elements from Boombaugh's theory. <clears throat> now, uh, that again is his achievement that he's most well known for. But he did much more than that. Even in this uh, book, uh, Capital and Interest, which are again a collection of articles, uh, another achie- great achievement that he made that Murray uh, Rothbard has pointed out is that he gave us a general theory of factor prices. You can maybe the first economist, at least in the Austrian tradition, to do this. So it was Fetter who first laid out the theory of rental prices, that uh, wages paid for labor and uh, rental prices for land and rental prices for capital goods can, are all analyzed in exactly the same way. Their theoretical explanation is identical. Every factor uh, produces a factor service, and it's the marginal value product of that factor service that determines the wage or, or the rental price, whatever it happens to be. Uh, he even, of course, had a, uh, had a uh, theory of a discounted marginal value product. And so he was even advan- as advanced as uh, uh, Murray Rothbard himself in that respect, realizing that, uh, uh, that the capitalist entrepreneur would not pay the full marginal value product to a factor in advance, but... In fact, uh, Federer actually argued that the capitalist entrepreneur not only gives money to the factor owner in advance and thus earns interest, but he gives him something like insurance. He didn't mean that, you know, in the sense of a contractual, uh, you know, we think of buying insurance. But he, but he would give the worker, for example, the capitalist entrepreneur would typically uh, give the worker a longer-term contract, like a year contract. Or now, you know, standard length of contract is three years. And since there's some job security here, there's like insurance of always paying the wage that you contract for, regardless of the profitability of the business, right? 
you would have to renegotiate the contract in order to uh, lower the wage. And so there's something like uh, a removal of risk, we might say today, removal of uncertainty from the uh, worker and the assumption of the uncertainty onto the entrepreneur. So Fetter was uh, fully cognizant of that. <coughs> uh, Fetter also had the, uh, had the Boombaab Works uh, concept of the structure of production. And so he, in, the, in these articles, was integrating his interest theory into the structure of production, pointing out that all the stages of production require this uh, interest payment and that the interest rate is the price spread that exists between the stages of production. <clears throat> he argued in a typical Austrian way that time preference is a part of man's nature. It's just, it's just bound up in the nature of reality that we have time preference. It's again a very Misesian way of uh, arguing about it. <clears throat> uh, he also used the time preference theory to rebut the uh, exploitation theory of, uh, of profit. So the co- it was a very common theory back then that the profit exists because uh, the capitalist entrepreneur is able to exploit the worker. He pays the worker less than the value of his marginal product and keeps the surplus value. And Fetter showed, no, this surplus value is a payment for interest. It's not a, an exploitation of the worker. The worker agrees to the discounted marginal value product when he's paid his wage. And, and not the marginal value product. Uh, okay, uh, but Fetter's main book was uh, Principles of Economics. The first edition, 1904. <clears throat> so remember, 1904 is eight years before Mises uh, writes or publishes a theory of money and credit. Eight years before we see a mature Mises writing books. Fetter puts out his uh, magnum opus. <clears throat> and in this uh, book, uh, Fetter uh, attempts to do what Mises would uh, later attempt to do in the theory of money and credit. He attempts to give a general theory of value. Okay, This, this was a, a common uh, uh, project uh, in that day. Uh, Mises wasn't uh, unique in this. So he wanted to, he'd already given a subjective value uh, explanation of uh, interest. Interest is based on time preference. Time preference is just our subjective valuation of sooner versus later, and as we've spoken about earlier in the week. So now he wanted to expand that to value theory in general. The theory of prices then uh, would be a subjective value theory, and as we'll talk about in a minute, he also attempted to erect a, a subjective value theory for money. So he, again, was a, in a sense a precursor of Mises. <clears throat> uh, in, in all of this, he uh, adopted an axiomatic deductive method. It was strictly Mengerian uh, or uh, Misesian in this sense. Let me just read a few quotes from uh, his book on this. He says, economics proceeds uh, by gradual steps as in a series of geometrical propositions from the simple and familiar acts and experiences of the individual's everyday life through the more complex relations to the most complex practical economic problems of the day. Okay, that could have, sentence could have been written by Murray Rothbard, right? Uh, he says in another place uh, in the book that in economics we, be, we begin with the simple and almost self-evident proposition that the motive force in economics is found in the feelings of men. It's a subjective value uh, drives uh, economic action. And one more, he says, uh, quote, in studying the problem of value, he means, he means the problem of price theory, right? A price. Uh, one must recognize any motive that leads men to attach importance to acts and things. So again, this is a, the hallmark of the subjective value uh, reasoning. Uh, as we spoke about before uh, and earlier in the week, uh, when you have a subjective value theory of a price, it's based upon the law of diminishing marginal utility. And so uh, Fetter uh, talks about this. As with time preference, he considers this to be the nature of man. This is the nature of man. Somehow it's just embedded in reality that there's diminishing marginal utility. And when we have a ne- another unit of a good, its value is applied to a lesser uh, valued option. or it's a, It is applied as a means to a lesser valued option. Uh, he, he built both supply and demand from this um, basis. 
And so he said, he said, behind the demand and supply curve, both the demand and supply curve is nothing but subjective value. The seller is giving up more units of the good, and thus the marginal value rises along the supply curve. The buyer is obtaining units of the good that he values less, and so we move down the demand curve. So we're left with nothing but uh, a subjective value behind the price. Uh, he also adopted uh, Boombaugh Works uh, theory of the price being set by the marginal pairs of buyer and seller. This is something we didn't get around to talking about uh, earlier in the week, but just to use the graph to illustrate, there's some uh, buyers who are willing to pay higher prices than the market clearing price, right? We might locate a buyer up here, his demand up here. In modern uh, language, we would call this a super marginal buyer. Right. Someone who's willing to pay much more than the market price to buy the good. Then there's sub-marginal buyers. These are buyers who would buy the good if the price were lower, but the price is too high for them now. They're potential buyers, but not actual buyers. And then there are sub-marginal sellers. The price is too low for sellers on the supply curve up here to supply, but they potentially could supply or would supply if the price were higher. And then there's sub, or excuse me, a super marginal, <coughs> super marginal sellers down here who think the price is very, very good. They'd, they'd be willing to sell the good for a lower price. So they're positioned on the supply curve down here. Well, clearly the price, P0, isn't anywhere near the prices that would be paid or accepted by these guys, right? The super marginal buyer would pay a much higher price than the market clearing price. The super marginal seller would accept Let's say he's right here. He would accept a much lower price. See, the price is set by the marginal pair, right? The marginal buyer and the marginal seller. The marginal buyer is right here. He's just willing to pay the price. And the marginal seller right here, he's just willing to pay the price. So prices and markets are reflective of the valuations of the marginal pairs. This is how Bumbavork put it. And uh, Fetter uh, adopted that view. <coughs> The least eager buyer and the least eager seller. These are the marginal buyer and seller. Uh, Fetter was also very big on the law of proportionality. This was a major contribution that he made to economics that uh, Mises cites in Human Action. And he defines the law of proportionality this way. He says, it's the fundamental axiomatic truth that there is a best or proper adjustment of means and ends in man's action. As Murray Rothbard puts it in Man, Economy, and State, it's, there's always an optimal use of a factor, right? If we use more of a factor with a fixed complementary factors, then average product rises, and then it hits an optimal point, a maximum point, and it falls. So there's a law, there's a, there's a law of proportionality, right? If we vary the proportions of the inputs, we'll find an optimal point where the factors are used in a way that we get the greatest amount of ends for a given means. <coughs> So Fetter had that, uh, and of course, uh, the law of proportionality is a more general principle than the law of returns. The law of returns would be a subset or an instance of, a uh, specific instance of the general principle of the law of proportionality. So he had all of that in his rental price theory. His marginal value product, as we mentioned earlier in the week, is based on marginal physical product. <coughs> uh, then from, uh, from this uh, theory of uh, rental prices, he uh, also established the theory of capital value. So he went on to point out that the purchase price of assets has to be equal to the discounted uh, value of their uh, marginal uh, product over time, the stream of their discounted marginal value products. <coughs> and he was, uh, he was uh, also quick to point out that uh, in this calculation of discounted marginal value product, the productivity of the factor affects the marginal value product of the factor, and it enters into its rental price then. But the interest rate is independent of that. The interest rate is what you use to discount the value of the output that's produced by the factor. And so the productivity of the capital good doesn't affect the interest rate. It affects only the marginal physical product of the factor. <clears throat> and again, this is a very, uh, uh, a very important point that he's making here quite in advance of all of this argument that went on uh, somewhat later in the lit literature about uh, wh what is the correct theory of interest. 
Uh, I mentioned he had a subjective value theory of money. Uh, he divided uh, money uh, into the following types. He says there is something that we might call primary money, by which he meant gold and silver coin. And then he said there are money substitutes. And these would be you know, obvious things like bank notes and uh, checking accounts and so on and so forth. And then he said, third, there's political money. And political money, he said, is just based on legal tender and political power. Yeah. So political money is something else, right? It's a different category of money from uh, primary uh, money and uh, money substitutes. Uh, and then he said, uh, it, of course, money demand, uh, uh, money, uh, demand for money exists. And this demand, he said, was uh, based upon the uncertainty of the future. We hold money because of contingencies of the future that we want to adjust to with these money holdings. So it's subjectively evaluated, just like uh, any other good. And he also uh, had a theory of arbitrage about money's value. It's something like Mises' uh, purchasing power parity theory of exchange rates. Or you recall Mises goes through this elaborate, elaborate argument in theory of money and credit, and he says, okay, what if we have uh, one geographic area where this money uh, is a medium of exchange? Okay, then its purchasing power is determined by demand and supply of the money. Okay, well, what if it's used in two different geographical locations? What if, what if the money can be exchanged uh, for another money somewhere else and thus used indirectly, so to speak, in some other geographical location? Well, he says, well, obviously then the purchasing power of the money will have to be the same in these different markets, right? It'll have to be the same. The value of the dollar would have to be the same in the United States as it is in France. If it wasn't, if it were higher in France, then arbitrage... Uh, could take place. You could earn a capital gain by transferring money, the dollar, through the franc into France and buying French goods. And so, inter- uh, excuse me, exchange rates would adjust to make the purchasing power of money the same everywhere. This is the purchasing power parity theory. Now, Fetter didn't have that theory, but he did have the rudiments of it. He said, arbitra- if money's tradable in two distinct geographic markets, arbitrage will make its value the same. So, purchasing power of money in New York state is the same as it is in Nebraska. That, that was his argument. And again, this is repeated by Mises in the theory of money and credit. Uh, his theory of growth was, uh, was a straight uh, Austrian uh, based on capital accumulation, saving and investing. And of course, he recognized that time preference is a key to all this. Time preferences go down, we save more, we invest more, we build up the uh, capital structure. He also... Uh, he also uh, had the uh, rudiments of a theory of the business cycle. Uh, he called it a theory of uh, crises and industrial depressions. And so he recognized that there were periods that the market went through. Um, first, uh, the first the phase of the cycle he called prosperity. And he said a prosperity phase is where money, credit, and confidence are all increasing. And then there's the crisis phase which he said was the decisive mo- uh, moment or turning point or the collapse of prosperity. You notice again, this sounds just straight Austrian, right? just like Mises or uh, Rothbard. And then he said there's the depression phase, which is the readjustment of economic activity to the financial reversal of the crisis. So, you know, he, he has this basic structure of what the uh, uh, business cycle is. Uh, in prosperity, he says old... Enterprises are resumed, new ones are uh, started. Uh, they're spurred on by profits that are created by uh, the additional money uh, that's coming into the economy. Um, he points out that these pro- he calls these profits uh, partly illusory. They're just on paper, they're not real, they're not realizable, but they're just uh, fictitious. <clears throat> and then these profits spur entrepreneurs begin to demand the factors and so wages begin to rise and you get this period of prosperity. Uh, and then he says the, the thing that brings on the crisis is specie outflow. Remember, he was writing in, in, in the era of the gold standard, the classical gold standard. So once again, if we have a situation where, let's say, the dollar uh, supply is increasing in the United States and so its value goes down in the United States, but exchange rates haven't moved internationally, then arbitragers will begin to move the dollar overseas. it will be dollar outflow, right, or gold outflow. And the gold outflow then reverses the process of monetary expansion domestically. 
And so that was the mechanism by which the uh, boom came to an end uh, under the gold standard. So he recognized this. Uh, money outflow would collapse, the increase in the money supply, profits would reverse. He said the banks would uh, uh, have to retrench their lending because their reserves would have to be replenished. So they'd have to sell off their loans and uh, hold, hold uh, larger reserves. Uh, stock and bond prices would fall as demand for them collapsed. And so we get the whole uh, process of the, of the crisis. Uh, he says the crisis is the forcible and sudden readjustment of mistaken capitalization of productive agents. Again, a sentence could have been written by uh, Rothbard. <clears throat> uh, the Depression then is a period of readjustment where the uh, factors of production are reallocated into their uh, best uh, uses, given that they've been misallocated during the uh, boom. And then uh, uh, finally, let me talk uh, briefly about his theory of entrepreneurship. He was very sound on entrepreneurship. As I mentioned, this uh, perhaps came from his practical experience as an entrepreneur. He was very good at running his father's bookstore uh, uh, when, when, he was, when he was quite young. And this entrepreneurial spirit uh, seemed to be part of his uh, makeup. <clears throat> so he, he calls the entrepreneur the enterpriser. That's his word for it in uh, his principles book. He says the enterpriser has the skill of judgment. And by judgment, he means an accurate assessment of the future. Um, he says different people have this skill in different degrees. And so in the market, uh, we tend to see a competitive process weeding out those who are lesser able to do this and uh, those who are better able uh, are successful. And so just like uh, in any uh, part of the market economy, Competition tends to uh, arrange the division of labor in, in the proper way, so that always the person with the greatest comparative advantage gets that task. Um, if the entrepreneur then earns a profit as his income, and this uh, income accrues to him based upon the accuracy of his foresight, uh, this is a residual that, that he earns uh, after paying his costs. And as I mentioned before, he held the view that the entrepreneur... Uh, Earn, the capitalist entrepreneur, at least, earns interest by paying factors in advance. So he had this Misesian notion of what we might call gross profit, gross profit uh, corresponding roughly to what accountants would call net income. And gross profit then being made up of profit, which is earned as a pure residual, and interest, which is earned because the entrepreneur lends funds into the production process at the beginning. And Mises added another category, which Fetter doesn't talk about, which was entrepreneurial wages. So the entrepreneur might actually get implicit wages because he works uh, in the business. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let's talk a little bit about Hazlitt. Uh, I'll spend uh, less time with Hazlitt. And <coughs> a little bit more with Benjamin Anderson, uh, just on the assumption that you know a little bit more about Hazlitt than you do Anderson. Uh, Hazlitt was born in 1894 in uh, Philadelphia and uh, lived to the ripe old age of uh, 98. He died in 1993. Uh, his father died, his biological father died when he was two. And his mother remarried and his stepfather moved the family to Brooklyn. So they moved to New York uh, when he was about nine. Uh, when he was 16, his stepfather died. He had a very difficult uh, childhood, I mean, in this sense. You know, he never really had a steady, uh, permanent father figure. Um, he entered the College City of New York to study psych uh, psychology, but, but of course he, he couldn't support himself, right? He couldn't support himself and his mom, and so he dropped out. Uh, without uh, finishing. And he went on to uh, uh, just an incredible career uh, as a public intellectual. Uh, the estimate is that he wrote that all of his writings, published writings, would be roughly 10 million words. Now, 10 million words, if you did a collected volume set, would be about 150 volumes. I mean, this is, it's so staggering to think of this. Uh, and he wrote across a huge number of disciplines. I mean, he didn't just write economics in one lesson, right? That kind of thin, but very uh, brilliant book. Uh, he wrote a novel. 
uh, still in print. Uh, he wrote a trilogy on literary criticism, which is really where he made his reputation. He wrote a book on psychology. Uh, he wrote a book on uh, moral philosophy, um, and so on. So he, he, he uh, as we tend to say, it was well read. I, his, he was a brilliant man who, whose mind uh, encompassed a huge number of uh, subjects. His first job was at the Wall Street Journal as a stenographer. Really modest beginning. Of course, he was 17 or 18 at the time. Uh, then he became an editorial writer for the New York Evening Post in 1916. Spent a couple years there. A few more years at the New York Evening Mail. Uh, his first uh, big job, though, was with the New York Sun in 1924 to 29. He was a literary critic. And as a literary critic, of course, what he did was he read, he did book reviews. So he read all the books, all different disciplines, and uh, wrote uh, critical reviews. Uh, he, was so, he was so good at this that he was hired by The Nation, probably the leading uh, magazine of the time in 1930, and spent three years there as literary editor. And uh, during that period, he met Benjamin Anderson, and uh, they became friends. Uh, but he, he was so anti-New Deal that he got fired at The Nation. The Nation, of course, was a leftist uh, magazine. So they fired him, and uh, Mencken hired him to be editor of American Mercury for one year. So he held that position uh, before he went to his most famous uh, post, which was at the New York Times. So he's at the New York Times from 1934 to 1946. And basically there he wrote unsigned editorials. That was mainly what he did. Um, and he wrote book reviews. He wrote for the Times book review. Now, he did two famous book reviews in this period with the New York Times. The first was Socialism. He reviewed uh, Mises' book when it came out in English. He did this in January of 1938. He sent his review to Mises, and, of course, it was a very favorable review, and Hazlitt uh, recognized the argument right away, that how devastating the book was. Uh, to the uh, socialist uh, project. And so Mises writes him back and says, oh, you know, this is one, great, and, uh, you know, if you're ever in uh, Geneva, look me up, and so on and so forth. So they, they became the correspondents. And when Mises uh, immigrated to uh, the United States in 1940, it was Hazlitt that met him at the dock. It was Hazlitt that met the boat and took uh, Ludwig and his uh, wife Margaret uh, into New York City. It was Hazlitt that got uh, Mises his first job in the United States, writing unsigned op-ed pieces for the New York Times. And uh, Mises did this and earned a little bit of money uh, writing these editorials. And it was Hazlitt that introduced Mises to the people at Yale University Press and got his first two uh, English language books published, Bureaucracy, in 1944, an omnipotent government in the same year. And it turns out that uh, Hazlitt did more than just introduce Mises to Davidson and the other guys at Yale University Press. Hazlitt essentially rewrote these books in English. Mises, when he came to the United States, English was maybe his third or fourth language. Of course, with German speaker, native German speaker, he spoke uh, fluent French. He knew Italian, and he knew some English, but he didn't, you know, he wasn't well versed in these languages. He could read Italian and English, but, you know, not primary languages. And so when he began to write bureaucracy and omnipotent government in English, it wasn't very good. <laughs> His English wasn't very good. So Hazlitt actually rewrote these books and got them published. And this, of course, his relationship with Yale University Press is what led to Yale uh, taking on the bigger project of human action. And just maybe a little side story here. The people at U uh, Yale were very, very concerned, Yale University Press, were very concerned about this project. Uh, so Mises comes to them and he says, you know, I have this 800-page uh, book. It's called National Economy. It's in German. I want to rewrite it in English. Well, see, they remember the experience, right? They've already published two books by Mises that had to be written by Hazlitt essentially, you know, rewritten, heavily edited. Uh, 
And so, well, I don't know. <laughs> do we want to really do an 800-page book? It's one thing to do a 150-page book that Hazlitt has to rewrite or that you know, we have to have 10 uh, editors uh, go through. And so it was, well, yeah, we might be interested in this. Send us a few chapters. You know, it's very, they were very cautious. And uh, they did everything through Hazlitt. Okay? They said, Mises is going to send you the stuff and you tell us if it's any good. And so they send it to Hazlitt. Uh, Mises produces his first couple chapters and he sends them to Hazlitt. And Hazlitt just, Hazlitt says, well, he writes back to Mises as well, you know, this is just like perfect. There's nothing else I can say here. He said, he said the only thing I could uh, do is, uh, you know, if you wanted to write this book as a journalist would write it, I can give you some tips. And so he made some remarks about that. But then he just sent the pages with almost no corrections at all to Yale, and they, they were just effusive in their praise. Oh, this is wonderful, you know. And then they just dealt directly with Mises from now on. So, uh, so Hazlitt was really crucial to Mises' success uh, in the U.S., and then secondly, uh, Hazlitt uh, reviewed uh, Road to Serfdom um, in September of 1944. And it was that review that led to its uh, Reader's Digest version, which made it so popular in the U.S. Because Hazlitt, once again, you know, was, was uh, like the leading literary critic of the day. And so when he favorably reviewed a book, then its reputation was uh, greatly enhanced. Now, his own book, uh, most famous, was Economics in One Lesson. It was published in 1946. An academic, or a, uh, economic uh, bestseller, sold well over a million copies. Uh, Mises, Mises himself then vetted this book. Mises went through this, you know, looking for mistakes. And, uh, and uh, Hazlitt accredited uh, Wicksteed and Bastiat. Of course, as you know, this book is basically Bastiat updated for the 20th century. Um, his, uh, his main uh, points in this book that a uh, good economist has to look at uh, the long-run effects and not just the immediate effects of policy and that uh, the good economist also always uh, traces the consequences of policy not merely for one group but all groups. That's the one lesson, right? And then uh, the rest of the book is just the application. Uh, he then began to uh, write uh, during the uh, time at uh, the New York Times uh, anti-Brenton Woods articles. So he's a very uh, adamant uh, proponent of the gold standard. These have been collected into a book called From Brenton Woods to World Inflation. It was published in 1984. He predicted that the uh, pseudo gold standard would end in inflation and collapse. Uh, but he was uh, fired from the New York Times two years after Brenton Woods was signed. You know, the editor basically went into him and said, look, you know, it's, this has been signed by 43 countries. Brenton Woods was signed in 44, I guess. And, uh, you, uh, you know, you've got to quit writing these uh, negative articles about it. And he, was, and he just said, well, I can't stop writing the articles. You know, I'm, this is my view. I just think, I think it's going to end in collapse and so on. And he maybe wasn't exactly fired for that, you know, at the, on, that, uh, on that spot at that moment. But basically he was pushed out because of his uh, pro-gold Stands. He was then hired by Newsweek, and he uh, wrote uh, a column for Newsweek from 47 to 64. Most of this work was uh, was uh, at first against the uh, war economy, so he's calling for the repeal of all the war uh, intervention in the economy, and uh, it was anti-New Deal stuff, so they were against the New Deal policies, against labor union privileges, and always calling for the restoration of the gold standard. Uh, he attacked the Marshall Plan and foreign aid in this uh, time period. Again, there's a book, Will Dollars Save the World? that was published in 47. He became co-editor of the Freeman in 1950, did that for three years. Uh, and then he began his anti-Keynesian writings. So he wrote his line-by-line refutation of the general theory called The Failure of the New Economics in 1959. And the, the next year he came out with Critics of Keynesian Economics, which is a collection of essays. Um, which at the time were the best uh, essays uh, against Keynes. He moved to the L.A. Times in 1966, spent uh, uh, about four years writing there until 69. Uh, and even into the 1980s, he was still writing for the Freeman. He wrote for Human Events. He wrote for National Review, uh, only, you know, almost up to the end of his life. Uh, he had a great attack on the welfare state in 1968. He wrote a book called Man versus the Welfare State. 
And it was a very radical doctrine that he uh, set out. He made the claim that welfare programs of the government actually promote what they are designed to alleviate. You know, now, of course, we know that to be everybody thinks this is the case, right? You pay welfare mothers uh, subsidies and they have more babies out of wedlock or something. It's just common knowledge now, but it was very radical back then in 1969. And then he uh, wrote The Conquest of Poverty in 1973, which is his positive program for alleviating poverty. If you can't have welfare programs, what do you do? And he showed in that book uh, the history of how capitalism had uh, raised the uh, standards of living of the poor. So it's basically an historical study on how the free market uh, alleviates poverty. Now, uh, let me then uh, talk about Benjamin Anderson. Anderson, as I mentioned, was the uh, practitioner, so to speak, of the group. <clears throat> he was born in uh, Columbia, Missouri in uh, 1886. And uh, like Federer, he died in 1949. He got his uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri in 1906. Did a master's at the University of Illinois in 1910, and got his PhD at Columbia in 1911. So again, it was a you know, big-shot university. It was a, a well-respected, uh, <coughs> excuse me, degree. Uh, he taught uh, he taught uh, for a year uh, at Columbia, and then went to Harvard. And he spent four years at Harvard as an assistant professor. And my guess is I don't know this for a fact, but my guess is he didn't get tenure. Right, he's four years, and so he's probably coming up for tenure. Didn't think he was going to get it, and he went to uh, he he went into a banking. So he became economist for the National Bank of Commerce in 1918, and editor of uh, of a publication they put out called Commercial Monthly. And then after that, in 1920, he took the post for which he's famous. He was chief economist for Chase Manhattan Bank uh, from 1920 to 1939. And he, uh, he edited Chase uh, Economic Bulletin from 1920 to 1937. So he, he was the top economist at Chase Manhattan Bank for uh, the 20s and the, thir- and the 30s. Uh, then in 1939, he uh, went to UCLA, got a professorship, uh, named professorship at UCLA, and spent 10 years there. He died of a heart attack in 1949. He died somewhat prematurely. <clears throat> he was a world-class chess player. Again, uh, indicating his intellectual uh, abilities. He's like Murray Rothbard, you know, a grandmaster chess player. Uh, he wrote a book on chess, a, a primer on chess. He published in 1935. And so he's, he had w- wider ranging interests and in just sort of, you know, what, what do I do in banking? It's typical of the intellectual scope of these guys. Now, his first publication was Social Value. His first book. This was uh, 1911. <clears throat> this was his uh, PhD dissertation, and in this book he addressed the uh, the uh, primary question of value that was being discussed in in the uh, economic uh, literature of the day. And this problem is uh, how how is it that we show that there's any link between the individual valuations that people have in their minds and market prices, and that process of linkage, which takes place through the market, and what, what he called social value. How can we conclude that all, if all we have are individual valuations, that the market or any social process gives us something like social value? <clears throat> now, he recognized the, what he called the great cr- uh, contributions of the Austrians to develop the theory of value imputation. Okay, remember, value imputation is... A, we have preferences in our minds that we impute to consumer goods through our actions. So we buy something because we prefer it, and that leads to the price for the consumer good. And then entrepreneurs impute that value back to the factors of production with their demand. So they buy the factors of production depending upon the value of the consumer good. So, so Anderson said, yes, this is all correct. This is a great contribution, and uh, no theory of value could be without this. But he said that doesn't that doesn't quite get us to the uh, last uh, question. It doesn't answer the last question, which is, what does all this have to do with social value? How how does this give us a social value for things? Why don't we just say that this is still just individual value for things? Now, you remember the 
the Austrian answer to that, Mises' answer to that is that, uh, well, put, to put it in, uh, in uh, Anderson's terms, there's no such thing as social value. That's Mises' answer. You know, we, th- this is a, it's, a, it's a false proposition to say that we have to come up with something like social value. <clears throat> All we have to do is to show that the division of labor economizes, that is, it allocates factors to the highest valued uses. We don't need social values to do that. We simply need a, a way in which the individual values of uh, consumers can be manifested to permit entrepreneurs to make profit calculations. If that's sufficient to economize on the use of factors. And so we just we skip this last step of social values, just unnecessary. Now, Anderson didn't think so. Anderson thought, no, you have to have an actual social valuation in order to say that you're you know, maximizing welfare or you know, creating the greatest social value. <clears throat> now, he also thought, to, to give you the kernel of debate here, the crux of the debate, he also thought that marginal utility theory, the standard uh, approach to price theory, was not a causal theory. This is where social value enters into, thing, enters into things. He thought, margin, he thought the argument was this, that our preferences, our marginal utilities for things are somehow added up in monetary terms. So we say we have preferences in our minds and that generates revenues and the revenues are somehow the embodiment of the uh, aggregation of our values. That's entirely wrong, right? I mean, Mises never made this kind of argument. Of course, he's writing this in 1911. Mises hadn't written, but this wasn't the argument all along by Bumbavork or anyone else. So he, he sort of he sort of misunderstands what the nature of the Austrian position was here. And so he attacks the marginal utility theory by saying, well, it's not, a, it's not really marginal utility theory. It's not really a causal theory. And his argument was, it's not a causal theory because our preferences in our minds are not established by our own mental valuations. We don't somehow in a hermetically sealed room figure out what our preferences are. Our preferences are determined by society. They're determined by the social mind, he called it. It is a very popular idea back then. Even Hazlitt uh, liked to uh, use the concept of the social mind. The social mind is basically the uh, conventions of society, the fashions, the mores, the cultural... uh, uh, manner in which people conduct themselves. And you're saying that our personal preferences are developed by that? Are, are, yeah, he, Anderson would even go farther and say they're somehow determined by those even. Yeah. Here, here's then where you get a causal theory, right? The, and he didn't, by the way, say that the social mind was something distinct from individual action. He didn't say the social mind somehow exists uh, and imposes the, the preferences on us. He said the social mind, of course, is the result of individual action in some sense. But, on the other hand, it's also the thing that determines at least the scope or the range of our action. It's a very, it's a very difficult theory to grapple with. Yeah, well, well, it's circular itself, it seemingly, or at least it has some strange, strange aspects to it in this sense. But by the way, I should, I should add maybe, though, that it's not really that uncommon to think this way, right? I often get this kind of response when I go through a price theory. A student will say, well, yeah, it's all well and good, but we don't determine our own preferences. I mean, our preferences are sort of determined by all the conditions of our life. And Well, that, you know, sure, that's right. Our preferences are determined by ex- uh, external conditions, perhaps. But that doesn't, but, but that's a, you know, the idea of a social mind, though, is a step beyond that, right? It's something. Something more. He's, he's trying to say that the social mind is an objective thing. The social preferences, so to speak, are objective things, and they manifest themselves through individual action. And that, that's taking the argument. Uh, is the social mind individual, or is that? No, it's co- it's collective. It well, it's collective in the sense that it affects every individual's preferences. So it would be like you're the only woman, and you want to make a dress. And so, you know, who's going to determine what the style of that's going to be? But then all prisoner styles are determined by that, and then someone else might have a new mm-hmm. idea mm-hmm. of how 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. See, that's how he gets out of the difficulty of having to say that the social mind is some kind of a fixed objective thing, right? Because it's exactly the problem that your example illustrates with this whole concept of, well, how could anything new ever happen then? You know, our preferences are always determined by this uh, convention. Then how could we ever break out of this? How could anybody ever invent a dress if nothing like that had ever existed before? Where would the preference, the inspiration come from? Yeah, he says, well, well, yeah, we have to allow for that, right? The social mind isn't a fixed thing, but it is objective. That's his position. It's all very difficult. It, it, it's not, you should read it, though. You should try to read this book. It's not that hard to read. It's, Wait, uh, when he makes it, it social value. Oh, so that's his, yeah, his first, uh, his first book. His first book. <clears throat> okay, so so th- here he sets out his notion of the social value, and then he then he argues, of course, that social value, that demand curves are social value curves. Okay, now we have something objective behind them. We have a causal theory behind them. <clears throat> uh, now, his follow up to this was uh, his uh, next book that, where he followed up on some of those ideas of the uh, social mind was The Value of Money in 1917. And in many ways, this is a, a masterful book. Uh, this, of course, is written after Mises' Theory of Money and Credit in 1912. And so he can't claim any originality for some of his views here. But one of the great things he does in this book, and again, I'd recommend reading this. It's a wonderful exposition. He has a tremendous refutation of the quantity theory of money. So he spends a a large amount of time uh, refuting monetarist, sort of naive, basic monetarist uh, theory. Um, Mises does this uh, as well, of course, in Theory of Money and Credit. So he points out that, of course, in the quantity theory, we have no... We have no causation, right? The quantity theory, we just have uh, money times velocity is equal to prices times uh, real output. <clears throat> this is not, not a theory of causation at all, unless we, 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 get our, we get our causation ad hoc from somewhere else, right? right? So it's not, it's not somehow embedded in our notion of the quantity equation that there's a theory of causation here. And secondly, he points out there are no constants in this. Unlike uh, you know Milton Friedman's assumption that velocity and output can be considered constant in the short run, so that we get this uh, proportional relationship between increases in money and increases in prices, th- this just isn't so. And he was uh, very happy always to point this out with empirical data. You know, so he look, he uh, gather up data from the 1920s or something to show that you know, the money supply was increasing five percent and prices went up ten, or that there was an imbalance. Uh, uh, between these two. He also pointed out, quite interestingly, there's no time element in the quantity theory. And, and he thought that that alone sort of uh, made it uh, useless, or at least suspect as a uh, theory of money. He was concerned about uh, if you increase the money supply, then exactly by what process does it affect prices and quant- uh, outputs over time? What, you know, it doesn't seem obvious what the time element is or how time enters into this uh, quantity equation. Uh, he also pointed out the more standard kinds of uh, critiques. There's no unambiguous way to define the general price level, and so the P term is uh, in dispute all the time. Can't really define it correctly. Uh, he also rejected all the monetarist views of the day, mainly from Irving Fisher. Uh, for example, he denied that the, that the economy uh, is in equilibrium only with stable prices, which was one of the great mistakes of uh, Fisher, or that uh, also that uh, there was no affl- inflation in the economy if the price level was stable. That he too denied. He said, no, no, no. In the 1920s, we had a whole bunch of price inflation, even though the index wasn't uh, moving. Uh, he claimed that the monetarists ignored the connection between money and credit, and so they so their monetary theory was uh, incomplete because they didn't realized that monetary inflation was credit expansion. Uh, and, he, and he also, uh, finally, in criticizing the monitor, said, well, the, the, the only uh, solution the monitors have to depression is reinflation. Well, where does that get us, right? Reinflation, and we're just back to the same boom-bust cycle. Right? We, just, we get out of the depression by starting another boom, but then we're just following that with another a bust. <clears throat> 
Uh, he insists in this book that the macroeconomics has to be uh, micro-based, be non-aggregate and uh, non-mechanistic. And uh, like Mises in 1912, he insists in this book that you have to have a general theory of value. If you have a subjective value theory for price, then you have to have a subjective value theory for money. If you have a theory for uh, a price that's based upon the social mind, upon social value, then you have to have a social value theory of money. And so, you know, he's right about part of this, right? You need a general theory of value, but he uh, based his value of money on social value. So again, he said that the value of money is socially determined. It's determined by social value, determined by convention, we might say, that then operates through individuals as they demand and supply money. Uh, he was well aware of Mises' uh, regression theorem in his book. Uh, he's aware of uh, theory of money and credit. But he claimed that Mises had not solved the circularity problem. He had not solved the Austrian circle in his regression theorem. And he argued this in the following way. He said, he said any price theory, any, this is a kind of Austrian uh, standard price theory, depends upon three presuppositions. One, that there's value we have preferences in our minds. And second, that we have money. This is a monetary theory of value. And third, that the value of money itself is fixed. You see, there's a confusion here between money's value being fixed and money's value being objective. Mises in the, in the regression theorem was simply pointing out that money's value is objective. That is, our subjective value for it is based upon its objective value, right? His, his regression theorem doesn't depend upon money's value being fixed. That, that's entirely different. And so Anderson here is you know, just making a, a mistake uh, in interpreting uh, Mises' theory. But Mises hailed this book. He thought, you know, thought Anderson was a great economist and he liked this book uh, despite its uh, shortcomings. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the rest of this. His other major book, though, let me just mention it in a few of the accomplishments. It's called Economics and the Public Welfare. This is his most widely read book, uh, published right after he uh, died in uh, 1949. And this essentially is an economic finan- and financial history of the United States from uh, you know, right, uh, right before the war, World War I, until the end of World War II. It's a fantastic book. Uh, it's filled with uh, uh, devastating theoretical criticisms of competing views like Keynes and the monetarists. And it's a very uh, empirically oriented. So he has a lot of uh, data that show uh, the boom-bust cycle. He was a believer in the Austrian business cycle theory. And so he documents all this. Uh, he interestingly divides the, uh, the uh, New Deal uh, precisely the way that Murray Rothbard does. He says the New Deal had two phases. The first began in 1924 right, with tariff policy and monetary inflation of the Fed and ended in 32 when, when Hoover was uh, retired from office. And, uh, and you know, so he chronicles the boom-bust uh, in, uh, Fed inflation. Uh, criticizing the surrender of the gold standard and so on and so forth. And he says the second phase was 33 to 39 of, uh, of the New Deal. <clears throat> and he even points out that in the latter period, um, there, it was in uh, two parts, right? The Great Depression was in, was in two parts, so to speak. The early depression of 1930 to 33. Then there was a recovery in the mid part of the decade. And then another collapse, uh, 37 and on. And he points out that the, the rally in 35, 37, he attributes to the fact that the courts were beginning to strike down the New Deal policies. And then Roosevelt packs the courts in 37 and they reverse and the economy collapses. So it's quite an interesting uh, position that he takes there. And then finally, let me mention to Brenton Woods. He uh, was very much against Brenton Woods, similar to Hazlitt's view. And he, uh, he uh, also identifies the co- what he considered to be the cause of Brenton Woods. Why did Brenton Woods become popular? And he says it was because of Lend-Lease, the U.S. Lend-Lease policy uh, during the war. Since it was heavily devoted to Britain, we were lending much more money to Britain than other places. It caused massive devaluation, uh, move, uh, currency movements, devaluation of the pound especially.